Hello, I'm Alexander von Welcheck, and today I'm with my mother, Annette von Welcheck, and today we're going to start a story documenting her life, Annette's story. Annette was born in 1934 in Western Germany near the Dutch border, and today lives in Naples, Florida, retired with seven grandchildren. Annette, so nice to be with you today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your life, the early years, when you were first born in 34 and the first 18 years of your life? Well, I don't remember when I was born, but I only know from my uh, godmother that I was supposed to be named Josepha, and my, grand my godmother didn't like that name, so when she brought me back from church, she told my mother, now you have little Annette. And my second name is now Josepha. And that's why I was called Annette. And, uh, but it also was my mother's name. Her name was Antoinette. So it was in the family. And um, anyway, it was 1934. And uh, in Europe at that time, they still partied a lot. When, uh, when I was baptized, it turned into a big wild party with dancing. That's what I learned from my aunties later on. But <clears throat> then in 1934 was also the year when Hitler took power. Uh, the Germans were very uh, depressed and uh, it was a bad, uh, not just a recession, it was a depression really. But, but Hitler promised a lot of things apparently and a lot of people followed him, probably some family members because he turned really Germany around with building autobahns and trains and uh, 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 industries and so uh, a lot of people with uh, business people mostly followed his call. But uh, I remember my father saying the moment, and I remember that even, I was probably six years or something, when he invaded Poland, he left the party because he did not believe that Germany could ever win it and he didn't believe in war. He had been in the first one, so he thought that was terrible. Uh, Mama, your family was an industrial family and you had seven brothers and sisters. Maybe yes. you can talk a little bit about your father and his business <coughs> and his, your father's family. Well, my father came from a family of five sons and um, he was born in, I believe, in 1998 and uh, 1898 1898 yeah right yeah. and uh, when they had this terrible terrible depression in 1925 uh, all three sons the oldest three sons wanted to go to america and they all were already on a boat in bremen when my grandmother cried very much and um, he said to my grandfather my father was the third son. It was Josef, Hermann, and Heinrich. <laughs> Typical German old names. And um, my father said to my grandfather, if you give me the factory, he had a tiny factory, besides his other businesses, he had all kinds of businesses, but um, then I'll stay home. And so my grandfather gave in to that. And so the two men, Joseph and Hermann, left for America, and my father stayed home. And uh, my grandfather, of course, gave him a lot of hard times because that's what the old generations did. He was an old Dutchman. My grandfather was basically from Holland, right from the border. I don't know. That was, West, that was the Münsterland. They called it, that was a Prussian province that belonged sometimes to Holland and sometimes to Germany, these things. That wasn't always not so in order, I believe, in the 19th century. But I'm sure you're... Your father didn't stay back in Ahaus Wun just for the company. I think he, no, he had did. a love. Didn't, didn't he then marry your... Tell me about, a little bit about your mother. Well, uh, before that, before he was in, in gate, uh, wanted to go to America, he had a job learning a, 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 what is it, a trade. And then he also liked to paint. And he actually had a lot of sense for good art. He, because he was in Dusseldorf at the Kunstakademie for a while, 
and um, but all that didn't work in the in 1925. There was no, you couldn't make a penny, uh, nothing. People were just starving. Anyway, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. You were going to talk about your mother, how he met oh, your mother. Yeah, yeah. A little bit about your mother. Oh, yeah. Uh, my mother, I, I took a trip later on once when I was already in America. I took a trip with my mother and asked her about her, the, the relationship with my father. And she said, well, when I was a young girl, 16 years old, they were on a dance, at a dance in a, on a farm at Elzing. Remember Elzing? You yeah. were there. And Elzing's farm and, and they were dancing there. And father was the most handsome young man, she said. But then she didn't see him for many years. And then I believe in 1926 or 27, he came back to Wüllen Aarhaus there and she saw him again. And uh, that's when her, their love affair started. Even though my mother had a boyfriend, he was a teacher. And my grandfather was very much in favor of that because my grandfather liked the academics and all that. And, uh, but uh, I guess mother loved Heinrich and they got married then in 1920, uh, let me think, 28. They got married in 1928. Mother was about 25 and my father was about 31 years old. And uh, I have pictures of a big wedding with everybody there because my mother came up from a family of 12 children. Oh, wow. And, uh, the mother was the oldest. She ha came from. She always had to work very hard because that's what they. She had to take care of all the babies. Every year, a new baby came along, and my grandmother was just usually in bed. And my grandfather was a very kind man. Served her coffee every morning. My mother said she had to work really hard as a young girl and was so happy to get married and get away from it all. And but then again, she came into. She had to marry into a family, that's how the tradition was. She married into my father's family now, but there were not, no children there. There was this grandfather who was a grumpy old guy, and uh, mother lived then there, and because grandfather was always very grumpy, uh, my dad didn't like to come home early in the evenings, since so, she had to listen to all this, uh, <laughs> she said it was sometimes very, very difficult. I think your parents then went on and had seven children. Yeah. With you in the middle. Maybe you can speak about yeah. your seven <coughs> brothers and sisters, the oldest well, to the youngest, and we, maybe talk a little bit about each one. We were seven children, one after the other, I believe, I guess it was. And... Uh, uh, the oldest uh, When one? I was... Well, there's something else. They, uh, when I was... Now business started after 25, when, when, no, not 20, 34, when I, was, when I was just born. That's when life was getting better, because the, that was when Hitler started building autobahns and the industries came back, and our life at home was getting better. And my father, the old house he inherited, was totally rebuilt. I remember when I was, not remember, but I vi very, little bit of a dawn like memories that I went with my grandmother to another town and I remember I have a picture of him when I was and I adopted that dialect that was like Dutch or you know but anyway they, they built a new house and we had seven we were seven kids the oldest one was Gertrude she was born in 29 Heinz was born in 28 and then Vinnie 26 I believe and I was born in 34, and then Eddie, Hubert, and Elizabeth, all seven. And uh, I believe we all were very healthy. I don't remember ever, anybody ever being really sick. And uh, when I was, when I was, uh, uh, was uh, let me think, in 1940, no, 39, they sent me to Bocholt to my my father's brother's place because they had no children. It was Uncle August, it was a much younger brother, he has no children. And Tante Josefa, who happened to be my godmother, she wanted me so much. So I lived there for a whole year from, from uh, I, I do remember the time very well because I went there to a beautiful nursery, they had a nursery school there. And I learned all the songs and I remember marching a lot because remember there was at the time 
when he, Germany started marching. I, Do you remember any of the songs that you learned in kindergarten? Uh, no, well, yeah, there were some. Uh, I, I sang them later. I taught. I taught. Well, I have, to, I have to jump here a little bit. That was a great time. And when I came back from that school, my uncle, who of course loved me, he put me. He was a baker and had a con had a bakery, and a store and conditorai, you know, with cakes and all that. And he had like three guys working for him, gazellen, they call it a gazelle. And they, when I came back, they put me on top of that big table and I had to dance for them and sing. I remember that very well. My uncle promoted that very much and I had to sing all these songs. But no, this was, this was, no, I don't remember those songs, but I remember different ones later on. So anyhow, um, then 19... 45, when I was then just 10 years old, uh, my parents decided that I should come home. It probably had to do, the war started, and I had to start school, regular school, right? So they decided, they picked me up and I had to come home again. And I started school as an e mention we call it. They call it e mention because you learn first the E, uh, the I. Einmal rauf, einmal runter und Pünktchen drauf. <laughs> <laughs> that I remember, rauf und runter, Pünktchen drauf. It was an e mention And then, of course, also in second grade, things changed a little bit. The Nazi party took over. And I do recall the teacher saying, kids, we have, they were all very religious because it was a small town. And uh, so we had to pray, but we could only do it secretly then. So she looked out of the door and she said, oh, the yellow pheasant isn't around, so let's pray. And I think the teacher was lucky that nobody ever, you know, called on her. So that was the first and second and third year. And then the wars got, became very intense when I was the third year. Then they came already during the day a lot. The, the, the planes came and it, it was very bad in, 40, in 1944. We had to go into the fields because by that time, um, the Allies had invaded were in Holland, and being so close to the border, the airplanes would come during the day and some and, in, and at night you could the sky was dark with planes and we were lucky that they didn't leave their they left a few bombs once in a while. We found big crates in our garden. We were lucky they didn't hit the house, and uh, and then. Uh, then they came at night, it was, they pulled us, my parents, we had a couple of mates, they pulled us out of our bed at night and uh, we had to go into the basement. And my mother's arms weren't long enough because she wanted to, got all the kids, I remember her sitting there and I could snuck in with, on one side because before, being number four, the oldest three had to sit in the other basement. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those were important things. I, that was very important. I still could get in the arms. And then the Madonna was hanging there and the cross and all we did is pray and sing. And we had neighbors in the basement too. We weren't alone. There were neighbors and one teacher, she was living there. So she knew all the songs. And, but anyway, I shouldn't talk about all that time. That's all passé. Then the invasion came, not the invasion, the, 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 the Germans were losing the war and the, we got the English occupation. They were winning and they came in. And uh, they came into the basement, they saw us all, but they saw there were only women and children. We were only women and children and they left us alone. I was so scared. I thought the English had horns because they were the enemies. What did I know? I was six years, not even, how old was I? Six or five years old. And. Um, but they were okay, they didn't, they didn't do anything bad. Even though my father was a, as a man, was, he was the only man, but he was very sick. My father became a diabetic already very early uh, and he couldn't get the proper medication. So by that time in 45, he was very ill and he looked like a really old man. So she, even though he was only 50 years old or not even, but he looked like a really old man. And so they left him alone. And uh, then, uh, Women were in, our, in the basement that lived in our house that had been totally bombed out and they were crying. Their mothers were in the debris there somewhere. They didn't know where, they, where their mother and father where they were. And, uh, but then finally we came all out of our basements and 
Then, two days later, the British asked my dad that we should move out of the house. But in the meantime, our house was so full of people that were bombed out. Several uncles were bombed out, aunts. They all, we were all two people in one bed, even though we had six or eight bedrooms even. Under the attic was another two bedrooms. So they found in the neighborhood uh, uh, places where we could sleep, but the people, since they were all had no food, secretly these guys killed, should I told these stories? Yeah, so what they, kill, they killed some pigs, I guess, secretly. If they had been caught, they would have been arrested, but they weren't caught. And so every neighbor got a big, a big roast of something, and, or a big piece of meat, or ribs, or whatever they got. And that's why we could stay with them. And luckily, it wasn't so long. First they said for months, and then, then it, was, it turned out, I think my dad talked to these people. He, well, my dad was a very... Um, he was very uh, social and the Englishmen liked him and he spoke half, a little bit English and Dutch so they got along. And um, so we all could go home again. And then of course the biggest thing was the next morning, I have to always tell this story, the next morning we all met in the hallways because we were full of fleas and fly, not fleas and... Lice. Uh, lice, yeah lice. I was full of lice and scratching because it's, even though they'd cleaned the beds, but they were in the mattresses in the meantime because the soldier, soldiers have lies, I guess. Yeah. So now, you, you always talked about a lot of good times <coughs> when you were a young girl and growing up. You talked oh, yeah. about parties and you talked about yeah. that your father was a big hunter and about the carnival. Yeah. Maybe you could talk about some of the nice yeah. uh, cultural things and yeah. good times. Uh, that you had growing up as a little girl yeah. in Vilna. Well, even in these times, they would make their own schnapps and so on, and men were drinking, and we, we girls had to dance. We had that in, in the meantime, too. But these really good times started when the war was over, you know? I don't remember so much when the war was going on. There, I don't remember so much of good times. I had one uncle who used to sing some songs sometimes, but that, uh, no. Um, then the war was over, and that was the greatest relief. And because, but you couldn't buy things. But I had Uncle Joip, who just came back right after the war. Out of he was only in in France. He was in Paris all the time. So he came back, and he knew how to make schnapps, and uh, and 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 they organized things. And uh, so they had always something going on. And little by little, some uncles came back out of the war. My father, my mother, after all, had five brothers, and uh, only one didn't come back. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we had we had always something going on. And my sister Vini and I, we had to dance. <laughs> and uh, then, of course, as as things were getting better. My dad got the license back again for his hunting territory, and he could get the license for his uh, rifles. It was not guns, what was it, like the hunting rifles, hunting right? Rifles. Yeah. And uh, he even invited the English governor, and they came out there, and they, they went hunting on, on uh, what you call uh, uh, Treibjacht. It was a Treibjacht. The Treibjacht is when you have a lot of hunters and people that go through the fields to get the rabbits all going, and then all that. It's basically just shooting rabbits and hare and pheasants and all that. And um, that, of course, in the evenings ended up always with big Schüsseltreiben. My mother had made all their favorite food, whatever they liked it, and Tötchen most of the time, which was a famous. She was known as Tony Tötchen. She made the best Tötchen out of the rabbit's uh, stew that was absolutely delicious. Everybody came to our house for the Tötchen. And uh, then uh, uh, in the evenings, yeah, they, they had a good time. They sometimes made a little fire in the middle of that ent entry room we had because it was all tiled, a little fire, and Vini and I had to dance around it. And uh, I remember such good times. <laughs> That was my favorite time almost in life. And then Dad made us perform little shows we gave. Vinnie and I always had to make a little show. Waldemar and Pumphia. <laughs> that was so funny. Waldemar and Pumphia. And, and then you went, also had you, uh, you went, had some good <coughs> schooling. You went to school then in, I think, Ahaus. Yeah, when, yeah. 
When the war was over, then first I was in, in this public school at home there in Wuhan. In the, the school was right across the street from our house. And uh, then, of course, I, they wanted me to have a higher education. And a year after the war, I started Oberschule. There was a lycée in our house. It was like three kilometers away from our house. So I had to go there in the mornings. Of course, my, our bikes were all stolen, so I had to walk. And the, the English trucks were still all over the place. And I arrived at school sometimes all wet because of the mud that was... Just, the roads were in bad shape because of the panzers and all that. You know, what's a tank, right? Tanks, the tanks, yeah. yeah. And uh, so the, this school was always nuns, the lycée. And they were very strict, these nuns. Schwester Margaret and Maria Hilfe, or whatever, Josefa, oh, she was the worst. Sister Josefa. And um, so, um, uh, yeah, we, I started school there, and the first year right away was English. The second year was French. And in the meantime, also, my German wasn't that great because at home, my grandmother who was always still alive. She spoke only Dutch, you know, Plattdeutsch, which is. Dutch really, and so in, that's why when I go to Holland, I do I understand the Dutch very well. And um, so I had a tough time in the, in the first year, I had to really learn hard. Uh, and those nuns were very, stri very strict, we had to make so many words a day, you know. And, uh, and my mother was not that much into it that she could help us here too much, you know, her, all her kids. But anyway, after I did that four years, and then they, then they decided, well, this is too difficult. And in the meantime, the money had changed in Germany. Uh, in '49, the money changed from Reichsmark into Deutschmark, the D-Mark, the famous D-Mark, you know. Everybody in the world later on wanted D-Mark. That was probably one of the best currencies at one yeah. point, right? Part of the Wirtschaftswunder. Yeah. So, in being in the construction company, he made lime and cement, and that was so. He did, we did very well in no time. He had a Mercedes, and we did very well. That's why he could send three children into boarding school. Eddie Hubert and I, we all were in boarding school. And uh, then uh, the family, we did well, yes. And I always felt like, then in no time, I felt suddenly like a rich girl. <laughs> and. Uh, so I was going to, they sent me to boarding school in Paderborn, which is a, in the Sauerland, you know, it's in the, a certain area in Germany. It's very, it's very black. They call it very black because it's all Catholic. And very deep forests and mountainous. Yeah, yeah, but that's the yeah. surroundings, yeah. yeah. But this was, Salzkotten was a big cloister with nuns, you know, and they were very strict. Sister, Sister Leonie, oh my God, she was so strict. And um, so uh, that was a year, and then uh, we f my m mother found a better school in Düsseldorf, in Düsseldorf, Ratingen, and that's where I went then two more years. I think there's a, isn't there a poem that you learned when you were at school in Paderborn that stayed with you like a lot? Oh, yeah, yeah, from Bergengrün, let me see. Do you want to tell that story? Uh, yeah, okay, but I, I said it a few minutes ago. I have to get it from the beginning again. Die Hoffnung, das verloren sein, sind gleicher Stärke in mir wach. Die Lebenslust, die Todespein, sie ziehen auf meinem Herzen Schach. I'm sorry. It's sort of <laughs> Doch ich, nur mein bewusstes Ich, Beschau das Spiel in stiller Ruhe, und meine Seele rüstet sich zum Kampfe mit dem Schicksal zu. Loosely translated, that means the Hoffnung, the hope, and the being lost is at the same strength in my soul. Die the last, the last for life, the last for life. The, the lebenslust, the todespein, the lust for life and the pain of death, they play chess on my soul. But me, my conscious me, look at this in a silent way, in Stilaru, and my soul prepares itself 
for life. Or the shiksal. What is shiksal in English? I don't know that word. Shiksal. Destiny. The destiny of life, yeah. Yeah. To be the medium shiksal too. And you learned that when you were in school with the nuns in Paderborn, and after that, yeah. your mother sent you to Dusseldorf to school. Yeah. And what happened there? Well, a lot of it was all girls always. We didn't have any boys. A lot of things happened there. Once I was, I got in big, deep trouble. I had read the word, the book of Rebecca, that famous book of English uh, author. Um, what's his name? Like, it's a very famous book, Rebecca. They made a movie about it. And we went for a walk. We always went on these walks where the nun is in front, one at the back and in the middle, right? And the long line of 30 girls, 40 girls. And we walked through the city there, downtown Ratingen. And I see a poster Rebecca was showing in town. And I thought, my God, I just read that book. I have to see that movie. I was fascinated with that book. I was at that time, I think, 17 or 18. So I slipped out of the crowd into the movie house. And I'm not the crowd, the line. I slipped in the movie house, but of course, the sister superior found out about it. And when I came back, oh my God, I was so punished for it. And I was especially punished because I was the class speaker at my class. You know, do everything behind us and speaker. Yeah, like the I was a speaker of the class. And I was demoted, of course. She took that on away from me. She always liked me a lot, but she thought I went totally out of line. And uh, so that was it. So now at this time, you're 16, 17 years old. No, 18 then, 18, and it was over, you, yeah. You never, have you ever had a boyfriend by this time? Oh, yeah, you? yeah, yeah. That's another story. Oh. During, when I was home from Paderborn, uh, we had an Easter vacation, and I was just going on this transfer to Dusseldorf. Um, my f friends of my father, uh, uh, Mrs. Schlaps came, she just had lost her husband. He, uh, my dad used to go to the spa, but knowing I was him always. And mm. Mrs. Schlaps came with her son, who was about 22 or 20, yeah, about 22 years old. He was at the university, he became an uh, 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 engineer. He was supposed to, they had a construction company, you know, like what you would call a developer today. And uh, <coughs> He flirted with me. He, he was, I wouldn't call him handsome, but he was a very sophisticated young man. And being 17, I was, of course, very impressed. And we went dancing the second Easter day, and he danced a lot with me, but I never thought much about it. And once I was in Dusseldorf, I got love letters, one after the other. How much he was in love with me, etc., etc. Oh my God, I felt so great. I thought, and of course, I shared the letter with all my friends there because, and everybody was jealous. Nobody had a boyfriend yet, right? And what was his name? Karl Heinz. Karl Heinz Schlaps. Mm -hmm. So Karl Heinz wrote these letters. And then, of course, I had, I'd be, on certain holidays, you could go home. And um, then, um, one day there was some kind of a holiday, and um, he said, don't go home. He wrote me a letter, don't go home. I meet you at your aunt's place that was near Cologne there, in Burscheid, in Burscheid. So, of course, uh, I did that, which I probably wasn't supposed to do. <coughs> and uh, so we met there at my aunt's place. He arrived, there was a motorcycle and his boy and his friend. And my aunt being very generous here to stay there upstairs in a room. And so we had a good time. And of course, then when I was really kissed for the first time, really, not I think I'd been kissed before, but uh, it was getting a little more serious. And then he said, we are engaged now, he said to me. And I said, well, he gave me a ring even. And I think I was too overwhelmed. It was, being so young and wow, I felt and what happened. I you, felt very important. Did you, I think. Did, did you marry him or what happened? No. Um, first, they learned at home about it, and the whole family was upset. And especially the Schlapps company, the manager of the Schlapps company, uh, because he was the heir of that company, uh, they could not do get secrets engaged because the 
all the customers and what, what do I know, you know, the or traditions in Germany, I guess it's in America too, when you have a big company, the customers and the friends get all in, in, invited, right? Uh, the, the manager of the company that uh, Karl-Heinz was supposed to inherit, uh, he made a big stink that we could not be engaged. So my father was, I had to come into his office My father had to come into his office and uh, he had a little, I mean, he had his desk uh, at home and uh, all he could say, he said, it's a good boy, he says, but just posier mir nicht in meiner Kundschaft herum. That means don't have flirts with all my customers here because I think he could see that I was a little, that I like to love boys, whatever. So um, there was then but, but then I was still in, in, in Düsseldorf when my father died. He died then in March. And I remember Karl Heinz picking me up. He came to the school and he picked me up and told me that dad had died. And, uh, and so I went home and it was a very big funeral because he was very popular among the Bürgers, you know, all the local people. It was a small town, so everybody knew him, but also he was very well known in, in his industry. So it was a big, big funeral with a lot of guns. What is it called when they, the last, the last, there's a word for it, you know, that last, when they, the, the Trump. The salute? Yeah, the, and, and the, the letzte, the, the letzte Wacht, you know, but there's a name for it. You know, when they trump, the trumpet that. No. It was a very emotional thing, I remember. Mother was going behind the coffin with her seven dwarfs behind her, you know? Maybe talk about your seven brothers and sisters, yeah. because uh, you have, I think there are a lot of personalities, great characters, all very different. I think uh, everyone would love to know a little bit more yeah. about your seven brothers and sisters. Yeah, there were seven there. The oldest sister was Gertrude, and I would call her, she was a typical housefrau. She was a wonderful woman, she had a perfect home. She had a big home. The funny thing is, she actually married this Josef Dröge later, this, this man who, uh, the manager, but who became later actually the owner of that company. But that's a big story. But Gertrude was a perfect housefrau. Nice lady, always good. When I was in boarding school, she was always the one who sent the packages and everything. She was like a second mother. Then there was Heinz, who was only a year younger, but Heinz was a playboy. He was very handsome, and he knew it too. As a young boy, he was a devil. He, bought, he, he received more spankings from my dad than anybody, because father always thought he wasn't fit to take over the company. He was just a devil on wheels, we would say today. He, he did things that was unbelievable, but he also was... All the women adored him, so he was a big flirt, and he became quite the ladies' man. Then there was my sister Vinnie. Vinnie, uh, we became very aware after the war that girls had to learn something. We could not just wait for getting married. Vinnie already then went to hotel college, and she followed the career in the, in the, gas, in the hospitality business. And she actually worked right after that in the Petersberg, where there were all the big receptions, where Adenauer was at, at that time. And she was at the reception of the Shah of Persia then. And, oh my God, it sounded so great. And then there was a Haile Selassie, gave her a big, a big coin. And, and uh, when I saw that, I thought, this is something fabulous, what she's doing. And uh, then I was, I was the next two years younger. And um, Vinnie was a big career woman, really. I call her the career woman. Then I came me, I was more the adventurer. Then came Eddie, who was two years younger than me. He was, he was very much like a philosopher, calm. He liked to read poetry and philosophy. He was very, very... Eddie was a wonderful young man. And then was Hubert. Hubert was probably my favorite love in the family. He was, I could schmooze with him always. He was, he was four years younger than me. And Hubert was a schmoozer, but he also was a big, he became an engineer and he was very good at what he did. 
he had to die too young. He had a heart attack when he was only 40 something, 48 years or something old. And then was Lilo, the youngest one, who was a banker. And she was really your, I would call her your typical banker. She was very exact and genau. I never forget, I asked her once, she had a certain job where she had to bring the money into the bank with a, with a guard over here. And I said, Lilo, how much money do you bring? And she told me, Annette, you don't ask questions like that. <laughs> now you <laughs> Can said I that, say that? Your, that your sister Vinnie was a career woman and went yeah. off to hotel school. And I think you more or less followed in her footsteps and also did hospital. Talk about how you went after Dusseldorf to your next schooling and uh, what happened then? Yeah, well then first I thought I was, when I was finished with Dusseldorf, I thought I'd become a teacher. And I, but I had to make a practicum for that, what you call a home, econ, home economics, you know, teacher. So I had a practicum and I found a family in, in, in Lübeck and it was a fabulous house with antiques. It was, I was so impressed with it all and they had no children. But then after a month or so, I found that it was terrible. These people were totally degenerated because they slept till 12, there was nothing going on. So I left and I went to Hamburg. And, but without the knowledge of my mother, oh, but I have to intercept. Bef when I was finished with Dusseldorf, my family insisted that I had an official engagement party. We all had long gowns and it was a really official engagement party because of yups and you know, we had to be. And uh, so I was official, even the priest came. It was an official engagement party, the biggest party you can imagine. We all had long gowns on and it was fabulous. And after that came then Lübeck and all that. And um, then when I was in Hamburg, Karl Heinz followed me. He was then finished as an engineer and he followed me and he was in Hamburg working for one of the biggest companies in Hamburg. But he was not a very serious kind of, he, he always, uh, he got in trouble. He liked to drink and he would go home and go to hunting parties and he ended up in a ditch someplace with his car. And uh, I know he was somehow always in trouble. That's when I realized, uh, uh I don't want to be engaged to a man like that. I end up with a bunch of babies and sit at home. I want to see the world. I want a free person. And also Germany was opening up to the world at that time. The war was over. The world, we had Daymarks and women uh, uh, learned uh, professions. And uh, anyway, the, the women in Germany were very strong because they had lost all the men in the war. So the women suddenly we found like we had a lot of power. And I got into that groove when I was in Hamburg. And I said, this is it. I have to find a way to get out of this engagement. And that was not so easy. Mother said, you can do this. You are engaged by the church. Mother was extremely religious, actually over the top religious. And um, so, uh, I came home, she picked me up in Hamburg because she, she came to Hamburg to see what I was doing. She didn't like what I was doing in Hamburg. I was working in a restaurant. She didn't like that at all. I had to come home. So when I was home, uh, Mrs. Schlaps and Karl Heinz came to the house and I thought, I have to now finish this. I have to get out of it. I couldn't do it on my own, but the mother of my best girlfriend, Frau Wolfring, oh, she was a wonderful lady. And she said, Annette, you have to get out of it because life is long. If you're not happy now, don't listen to anybody. If you're not happy now, get out of it. And uh, she was really my back. She had my back, right? And uh, so I found the, 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 that was the most difficult thing, I think, in my life, almost. Not quite, but almost. So you broke up. You I broke up. It was tough at that time. And what happened after that? Then you went to, <coughs> I think, Kegan's Yeah, then I went, when, when it was over, mother was very unhappy with me. You know, she said, you never follow anything through. She really um, scolded me that I didn't follow things through, you know. And I said, that's not it, my, you know, you're young. I was, I was at that time probably just 20, yeah. And then uh, 
I said, okay, mother, send me to the hotel college, like where Vinnie was. And the last, and then after that, I promise you, you never have to spend a penny on me again. And because in the meantime, mother was widowed with seven children, right? And my brother was not a lot of support. So uh, she, I'm sure she was worried. And uh, so she said, okay. And so I went to Wiesbaden, not Wiesbaden, Bad Wiese, Bad Wiese in, in near, near, near Munich, to the same school Winnie went. And um, so I spent a year there, but I, right away I told the director, Dr. Speiser, I said, my interest is in foreign languages. I want to, if I go in this business, I want to be in the, at the front. I like to be with people. I'm not a, uh, like an housekeeper or this sort of thing. I like to be in, on the, at the front desk. And so I want to perfect my French and English. And I said, I would love to go to France if possible. Well, the year was almost over when he came and he was so excited. We found a place for you. You must think at that time, the war hadn't been over that much. Germans could not go to any other country. They, we were not, we were not uh, welcome uh, to work someplace. Perhaps you could come as a visitor in a hotel to bring money, but not like, like learning things. Anyway, he, but he found me a place in Avignon, Villeneuve-les Avignon. So why don't we take a small break? We've just heard your life from 1934 to 1954 your family, all your time in Germany. We'll take a little break and the next chapter that we're going to discuss is how Annette finds her wings and goes international and discovers the world. Yeah, very good. <laughs> 